All right, this is the third video about um, how do continue, continuous functions behave on intervals of the real line. So the first result I wanna tell you about for this video is if you've got a closed and bounded interval i, and if you've got a function f whose domain is i, such that f's continuous on i, then the range, which is the set uh, f of i, which is all the outputs of stuff from i, is what it's trying to say, that should also be a closed bounded interval. So the image, I'm gonna call this the range. Instead of that, maybe you call it the image of i. The image of a closed bounded interval is also a closed bounded interval when your function's continuous. And I got a little picture for you here. What is this trying to say? If uh, i is my domain here, it's this domain, this interval that's closed and bounded from a to b, it includes the endpoints. Then what I'm trying to say is if f's continuous, then the range, which is up here in this pinkish color, f of i, should be closed and bounded also. So like I have those endpoints. Uh, notice also too that I'm not saying that uh, the range is the interval f of a to f of b, right? So like f of a is way up here and f of b is around there too. You know, that's not where my range starts at. So just be careful with what the theorem says here. It's just trying to say that closed bounded intervals get sent to closed bounded intervals by continuous functions. So what's the proof of this look like? So we know that f of i, right, so the image or the range, whatever word you want to say, is bounded since f's continuous. And what we'll do then, if I've got a bounded subset of the real line, then I can talk about the infimum and the supremum of that set. So I'll let little m be the infimum of the range, and I'll let capital M be the supremum of the range. So since i is closed and bounded, I know that uh, by the max-min theorem, uh, that ensures that each of these, that would be the min, and capital M would be the max, those have to be in the range. So those have to be achieved by this continuous function. So remember the max-min theorem says that continuous functions achieve their absolute maximum and absolute minimum, and that should by definition be little m and capital M. So therefore, what else? Well, little m is smaller than every point in the range, whereas capital M is larger than every point in the range. So what do we have then? We have that the range should be contained in the interval from little m to capital M. And to finish the proof, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that the reverse inclusion here holds as well to conclude that these two sets are equal. So that is where we're going next. So to do that, what we'll do is we'll start with Bolzano's Intermediate Value Theorem, which tells me that if you took any k that's in this interval from little m to capital M, there should exist some point c in my domain i so that f of c equals k. And remember, that was the idea that if I took any point out here, k, if I'm supposed to be able to draw that green graph without picking up my pencil, then there ought to exist a point on the graph whose y value is that k. So in other words, there should exist some point c in my domain whose corresponding output is k. That's what Bolzano's intermediate value theorem is trying to say to us. So in that sense, or what does that really tell me? Well, we just took any k that's in this interval from m to capital M, and we concluded that it lives in f of i. That shows that this interval is a subset of f of i. So what have I got? I've got that one's a subset of the other this way. I've got the reverse inclusion this way. Therefore, we can conclude that these two sets are equal, which is exactly what I wanted to show, that the range is a closed and bounded interval. What we're going to do is we're going to generalize this a little bit. So what we'll call this is the preservation of intervals theorem, perhaps. And so what this one is trying to say to us is that the continuous image of an interval is going to be an interval. Now notice I don't have any like adjectives to describe the interval, right? So I know that closed bounded intervals go to closed bounded intervals by a continuous function. But in general, what we can say is like, well, an open interval should still get sent to some interval, right? But maybe it gets sent to like a half open interval, where maybe you've got a parenthesis on one end and a bracket on the other. Um, that kind of stuff can happen. But at best, we can say that you should still get an interval. So how would we prove this? So let's take two elements, alpha and beta, that are in the range f of i. And let's suppose that alpha is less than beta. Uh, so what does it mean to be in the range? Well, if you're in the range, that means that those alpha and beta are the outputs of two things from your domain i. So there should exist a little a and little b. Maybe you see now why, why I chose these Greek letters here to correspond with these uh, letters here, uh, such that though f of little a should be alpha and uh, f of little b should be beta. So what we'll do is we'll apply Bolzano's intermediate value theorem again. If I think about uh, any number that's between alpha and beta, since alpha and beta were outputs of my function, then any number between them should be outputs of my function too. So there should exist some c that's in my domain i, such that f of c is equal to that k. And if I think about what does that say, that says that k is an f of i for every single k between alpha and beta. 
And so what does that say? Another way to think about that, that means that the interval from alpha to beta is a subset of the range f of i. So remember what I'm going for here is I'm trying to show that f of i is itself an interval. And what I've done so far is I was able to prove that if I took any two points in the range f of i, f of i contains the interval between those two points. That's what I've highlighted so far. But if we remember back in 2.5, it was a video about intervals, that there's a result in that section that said if you had any subset j of the real line such that the following happen for every x y that are in j such that x is less than y then the interval from x to y is contained in j that tells you that j is an interval you can conclude that j is an interval so if we think about what did we just do we just showed that uh, for any alpha and beta that were in f of i we just showed that the interval from alpha to beta is an f of i Therefore, f of i must be an interval by this result that I'm referring to in section 2.5 that characterizes intervals. So we proved that f of i has that property right here that I've highlighted. That's what I mean by that property. Uh, so therefore, f of i must be an interval. And so to give you some examples about uh, this one, right, again, some generality, a little more general than the, the closed one that we started with in this video. So if i is the interval from 0 to 1, and let's say f's the continuous function, just 1 over x, right? And then in that case, i is this nice, you know, uh, bounded open interval from 0 to 1. But notice that the range, right, or the image is this infinite interval from uh, 1 to infinity. So yes, they're both intervals, but notice, you know, they're not the same type. One's, one's a bounded interval, and one's an unbounded infinite interval. And so another example, if I let i be the whole real line, and if I took my function to be sine of x, um, I know sine of x is continuous on the real line, but uh, what's the range of sine of x? Well, the range is all real numbers between minus one and one. So again, notice these two types, these two intervals, they're not the same type of interval, right? One's this infinite interval and the other is just this closed bounded interval. The point though, again, is that an interval got sent, got mapped to an interval. So the image of an interval was still an interval. And maybe one more, but let i be the set uh, of all real numbers between minus 1 and 1, including those. And I let f be this piecewise function where it's 0 if x is to the left is 0, and it's 1 if x is to the right is 0, and, and or 0. And then the range of that would just be these two numbers, 0, 1, and so two points themselves are not an interval. So like what happened? Well, in this case, this function's not continuous, therefore I see that it's possible in that case. When your function's not continuous, then I can't really say anything about how does the, the structure of the, Im, of the domain that you start with for your function, how does its structure relate to the structure of the image, right? So like the, the image of this interval is not, not itself an interval. So this kind of idea of like what does a continuous function preserve, um, that's explored more in like a class called topology, where what we just showed is that continuous functions preserve intervals. Um, some other things that you'll see and you'll study in topology are some concepts called compactness and another concept called being connected. So when we um, you kind of have a lot more to work with with definitions of those things, but an interesting question is does a continuous function preserve that structure. So like uh, if, if, if the domain is what was called compact, I haven't told you what that is, but if the domain's compact, can you say the image is compact? Or like if the domain's connected, can you say that the image should be connected to? So that's kind of an interesting type of question that mathematicians like to explore. And so for continuous functions, I'll go ahead and uh, spill the beans. Yes, you can say that.